Trican Pharmaceuticals. It's ticker T-C-O-N, also a NASDAQ company. And we are joined with the CFO of Trican. It's Scott Brown. Scott, are you out there? Hello. Welcome. Hi, I am. Yes. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. I hope you're having a good day. I will let you take it away. I see your presentation. Looks like you are good to go. Great. Yeah, thanks so much. Hey, as uh, mentioned, I'm Scott Brown, CFO at Tracon Pharmaceuticals, and I look forward to telling you about Tracon today. So during today's presentation, I will be making some forward-looking statements. So Tracon Pharmaceuticals has multiple assets to highlight, the chief of which is our lead asset, Envofolumab, which is a rapid subcutaneous checkpoint inhibitor that we're studying in a pivotal trial that could lead to the approval of Envofolumab, assuming positive data in just over two years. So the clinical trial named the Envisarc trial will have interim data later this year, final data next year, and a potential approval in 2023. The pivotal trial of Envofolumab is in soft tissue sarcoma, which is a orphan indication in oncology with approximately 14,000 new cases of sarcoma diagnosed each year. And it represents a total addressable market of over a billion dollars in the US in all of sarcoma. So our business model at Tracon is somewhat different from your standard biotech or big pharma company who are all beholden to contract research, or research organizations or CROs as they're known to perform their clinical trials for them. So we have what we call a CRO independent organization that allows us to run clinical trials with our own team and thus avoid the high expense and long timelines related to using a CRO. The end result of this CRO independent platform is that we can run clinical trials at a much lower cost, much faster, but at a much higher quality as well than if you were to use a CRO. So importantly, what's unique is we've used this ability to run trials cheaper and faster as a business development platform. And we've done four deals to expand our pipeline in four years. Now we focus really on ex-US companies who lack the clinical development experience in the US and we engage in a profit share model whereby we'll run the trials and then we'll give our partners a much higher share of the back-end economics if the product is approved. So normally if a company licenses an asset to a big pharma, they'll get some nice upfront candy as we like to call it. But back-end it's typically about a 10 to 12% blended royalty. So really big pharma is taking the lion's share of the profit in that case if the drug is, is successful. So what we tell potential partners is that if you really believe in your asset, you want to partner with Tracon since you will get four times the backend economics as you would with big pharma by way of our profit share. If you don't believe in your asset, then by all means go with big pharma and take the upfront since it might be all you get. And in terms of how efficient this is cash wise, we only burned $18 million all of last year while getting this pivotal and the Sark trial up and running. And we expect this year to be in the low to mid twenties for cash burn as well. So using this platform, we've done deals with three Chinese companies and are looking to do additional deals this year as we further grow our pipeline. And we're looking at assets that would pair naturally with end of fall map, such as another IO target like CTLA four or lag three but also standalone assets that have a clear path to approval. In addition to Envifolumab, we have two other late stage assets. They include a DNA repair inhibitor that we're partnered with the National Cancer Institute on and a CD73 antibody that we licensed from the Chinese company IMAP. So if you've heard just a couple of weeks ago at ESMO, AstraZeneca had randomized data with their CD73 antibody in combination with their PD-1 inhibitor, PD-L1 inhibitor, excuse me, that we view as very positive for the target. Now, the key advantage of our CRO independent platform is a low burn rate, as you know, we expect to complete the Envisarc trial for, for no joke, less than $20 million, which is a fraction of the typical costs associated with our pivotal, with a pivotal clinical trial. And we recently raised capital in July. And so now we have a cash runway that gets us into 2023 past the final data readout for Envisarc. So I'll tell you a little bit more about our product development platform since it really is what makes Tracon unique. We have good assets too, but the product development platform is really our unique feature. And it's really all about aligned incentives. So we're incentivized to get the clinical trial done quickly for low cost, but it has to be high quality. 
because we're spending our own money and using our own internal resources to get it done. I mean, the, the CRO model is one of the most egregious business models ever. It's a fee for service model plus guaranteed payments, whether any work is done or not. It would be like using a lawyer or accountant and having them bill by the hour. But then on top of that, they have they get paid a monthly retainer and whether there's any work done or not. So the CROs are just not incentivized to get trials done quickly because it just means they can bill more hours if they don't. And there's no reason for them to be efficient. They figure, you know, why solve a problem quickly when they can involve a ton of people and build more hours to take uh, to solve it. So it's a completely misaligned business model. The longer a trial takes, the more they make. They, they're happy to run trials that will be hard to enroll or maybe don't have the best scientific rationale because it just means higher fees for them. So our model is the complete opposite. We tell our potential partners that we will run the trials ourselves. We'll use our own people. And so we will get your drug to, map, to market faster than anyone as we're incentivized by getting the drug approved and then with us commercializing it and selling it. We don't make any money before it's approved. And so we need to get it approved as quickly as we can. And it has to be high quality, the package that we submit to the FDA because we're just gonna waste time if it's not high quality. Now I'm sure you've heard that the average cost to approve a drug is about $2 billion. But that's because the big pharma companies use CROs who are not incentivized and just waste tons of time and money. Now compare that to the $20 million we expect it to cost to complete the Endosark trial, and we can potentially approve a drug for one one hundredth of the typical cost. And for us, it's all about harnessing global innovation. You know, we look for drugs that are in development across the globe, mostly in China, and we'll go to these companies and say, hey, let's take this to the US where you currently don't have any plans. You know, you may be running a trial in China or elsewhere in the world, but you're not in the US. And let's look for a small orphan indication to get the initial approval quickly, and we'll start making money, and then we'll expand the label from there. Now, Envifolumab is the perfect example. So our partners were running trials in China and hadn't thought about going into sarcoma in the US. So we said, let us do that. We'll get it approved, you know, in just a few years, assuming positive data and then we'll start selling it, and then we'll give you a really nice chunk of the economics. It just, you know, it just makes sense that way. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Enfolmab since it's our lead asset and what makes it unique and how it compares to products that are currently marketed. So what makes Enfolmab unique is that it's given by subcutaneous injection that literally takes 30 seconds. It's similar to how you would get a flu shot. And after it's given, the patient is free to go about their day since there's no chance of an infusion reaction as it's not an infusion. Now, why did we choose to go into sarcoma with enfolumab? And the reason is there was clear data from other checkpoint inhibitors that have the same mechanism of action that showed a 29% response rate in the sarcoma subtypes of undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or UPS and mixofibosarcoma or MFS where the current standard of care is 4%. So, I mean, that is a dramatic difference, 29% versus 4%. And it's just, you know, it's hard to imagine that patients currently only have a, a drug that's a 4% response rate. That is just, you know, incredibly low. Um, and we just thought we could do much better once we saw that data from other checkpoint inhibitors. So in addition, Earlier this year, we released data from our Chinese partners, Alphamab Oncology and 3D Medicines that showed enofolumab had a 40% response rate in another sarcoma subtype called alveolar soft part sarcoma or ASPS. And again, that was a great data point as it was a 40% response rate in a different sarcoma subtype. So we're moving enofolumab along at a really rapid pace as we executed the license in December of 2019. So it's less than two years ago. We began dosing in a pivotal study a year later in December, 2020, after a successful type B meeting with the FDA. We'll have interim analysis uh, efficacy data later this year, and then final data next year. If we were to have used a CRO to run this trial, it would have taken considerably longer. And speed is just so important in this industry, so you can be first to market with the drug. And importantly, as I mentioned, you know, we estimate the market size in sarcoma at over a billion dollars in the US, assuming parity pricing with uh, the currently approved checkpoint inhibitors. So now on the topic of other checkpoint inhibitors, there are currently seven that are marketed in the US. And I'm sure you've seen the commercials for the big two, Keytruda and Opdivo, 
which collectively has sales of well over $10 billion a year in the US alone. And Keytruda is expected to become the best-selling drug of all time in just a few years. So all seven of these drugs are delivered intravenously, meaning the patient has to spend at least half their day getting these treatments. First, they go to the infusion center. Then they have to get their infusion. Then they follow up with their doctor as there's a small risk of an infusion reaction since there is such a large volume of drug given at one time. Now contrast that with embofolumab, which is given in 30 seconds and has no risk of an infusion reaction because it's not an infusion. And you see why we call it a game changer for the treatment of sarcoma patients. So as I mentioned, uh, sarcoma is served by a very poor standard of care. You know, there are approximately 14,000 new cases of sarcoma diagnosed each year. And of those, about 6,000 will be metastatic or advanced and require systemic therapy. For those patients uh, that are metastatic or advanced, their treatment option, their first treatment option, first line is a 50 year old chemotherapy called doxorubicin that only has a 17% response rate. And now once patients, patients fail that treatment, their next option is the drug called Votrient with the 4% response rate that I mentioned earlier. The MSARC trial, we're enrolling these two subtypes, these two sarcoma subtypes of UPS and MFS, which combined have a about incidence rate of about 3,000 per year, 2,000 UPS and 1,000 MFS. And our goal really here is to give these patients a much higher option that has a much higher uh, response rate than the current standard of care, which is just abysmal. I mean, 4% is just, you know, it's hard to believe that um, refractory patients only have that available to them. And then after that, there really isn't anything else approved either. So as I mentioned, the total addressable market in sarcoma is a billion dollars, and we're attacking this uh, piecewise, and we're expecting a wave of potential approvals, assuming positive data, starting with UPS and MFS, which are about a $200 million market. Um, and, you know, we expect approval in late 2023 in these indications, assuming, again, positive data, and then to add on other indications like these uh, other small sarcoma subtypes, angiosarcoma, ASPS, and dedifferentiated liposarcoma that we know respond to checkpoint inhibition, and we expect to get a study up and running soon, and uh, assuming that study reads out positively, could get approval in 2023. I mean, sorry, 2025, which could be another $100 million in potential revenue. And lastly, we're planning a first line study in all sarcoma subtypes and a trial in GIST, which is gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And we could potentially be on the market in these indications in 2026 and 2027. And altogether that represents total over a billion dollars in sarcoma. Now, we did have a third party do market research and we estimate that we would have a fast adoption to peak sales penetration over about three years, reach over 80% peak penetration, and we'd price in line with other checkpoint inhibitors, which are approximately $15,000 per month. And the reason we're, you know, we expect such a high penetration rate of over 80% is there just isn't any much competition out there. You know, Physicians would be, they'd look at either the 4% response rate with Votriant or ours, which, uh, you know, could have much higher response rate based on that data from Keytruda. And it, you know, it just makes sense that they would give their patients uh, the option that has a higher response rate. So now I'll talk just a little bit about the structure of Emiflumab because it's a very unique molecule. So it's not a full length antibody like all the other approved checkpoints. It's what's known as a single domain antibody and it's about half the size of a traditional antibody, which means that it can be, it can be highly concentrated and given by subcutaneous injection instead of through an IV. So the other great advantage of Envifolumab is it is stable at room temperature for six months and so does not need cold storage. So you can imagine our goal here one day is to provide at-home dosing for patients through a single-use injectable pen, meaning that the patients wouldn't even have to go into their doctor to receive their treatment. Um, I mean, you can see how much of an advantage that would be for patients since uh, you know the time is really what's important to them. And if they could have their dosing at home by themselves, uh, similar to how you know other treatments are given these days and without going into the infusion center, that would just be amazing for them. 
So a little bit about the data for amphomab. So it's been studied extensively by our partners, Alphamab and 3D Medicines, and it's been dosed to over 700 patients. So while our trial is the only one currently ongoing in the US, there are two pivotal trials that completed enrollment in China. And one of them, the trial in MSI high cancers is actually under priority review right now by the Chinese NMPA. And it could be approved in China by the end of this year. So we, we don't have any economics in China, but the approval would just show that Enfolimab is advanced and you know everything's ready for it to potentially be approved here. The CMC is in line, the manufacturing. Um, we just would view it as very positive overall for Enfolimab and great for uh, our partners, 3D Medicines and Alphamab. So I'll get into just a little bit about the data and how we had the idea to license uh, Enfolimab in the first place. So this, this data was from ASCO in 2019, and um, Merck presented data from their checkpoint inhibitor, Keytruda, that showed this 23% response rate in the sarcoma subtype of UPS, which is, you know, what compared to that 4% response rate I mentioned earlier, it made us really interested in this data. So this was, I mean, this was great, great data, and Keytruda could have gotten approval if they would have expanded the study and en enrolled more patients. But um, after discussing with the investigator, she told us not only was Merck not going to enroll more patients, they were actually cutting the funding for this study. And it was just kind of hard to believe so that they you know, weren't looking for an approval here. They just you know, had done this through an investigator sponsored trial, but we just couldn't believe that they weren't looking to get this approved in sarcoma. So then we said, well, Let's go to China. We'll look at all sorts of checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, you know, we probably looked at at least 10 and we ended up licensing Envifolimab, which we consider the best one of that group from Alphamab and 3D Medicines. And it was really due to its unique method of administration. So quickly, I'll just go through a couple of the other data points here. So another trial in sarcoma, um, this one was in all sarcoma subtypes, and it was Opdivo, the BMS checkpoint inhibitor, and it had a 5% response rate, but that was in all sarcoma. But then the important thing here is when they combined it with uh, Urvoy, which inhibits the CTLA-4 pathway, they tripled the response rate. So it went from 5% to 16%, which is um, you know pretty amazing. And it's in line with first-line chemotherapy, as I mentioned, which had the 17% response rate. And then if you look at the cohorts that were just in UPS, again, the response rate went up considerably. So it's single agent, Opdivo had an 8%, and then uh, when adding Yervoy, it went up to 29%, uh, which again is, you know, is pretty amazing and, and why it's, we're so excited about our and the SARC trial. Scott, I want to give you about a, a one minute warning or so. I want to get to like one question. So if you want to do like a quick wrap, Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Let me, um, all good. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me go real quick. I'll just go to two slides if that's okay. Great. So, yeah. you know, we, we've hit our milestones so far this year, you know, we had orphan drug designation a few months ago. We've had two safety analysis that, um, you know, we've done press releases on that the drug was safe and we expect that first interim efficacy analysis later this year, and then possibly to request breakthrough fast track designation and endpoint next year. And then, um, just one thing on the, on the trial, you know, it's two cohorts, 80 patients each, which is why we expect a very quick um, accrual. It's only 160 patients. And so we're expecting to complete that accrual um, next year and then, you know, potentially file for approval in 23 and be on the market in 23. So, you know, in about two years, we could have a have a approved drug, assuming positive data from the trial. All right. So you've been hinting at it a bunch, but I want to just ask you directly so what is the advantage that Tracon has for the trial process? Why another company would want to use you guys for that? Is it the relationships that your team has? Is it the experience that your team has? Yeah. Yeah. So it's really both. You know, we've done sites that we've done studies at all of the major cancer centers in the U.S. You know, Mayo, both Mayo sites, MSK, um, pretty much everywhere. Memorial. It's like everywhere that's a big cancer center we've done sites. So we have these mm -hmm. great relationships. I mean, the company has been around for, you know, 15 years and it's really, so it's the relationships, but then it's also the speed, you know, we get studies up and running quicker than anybody and we enroll them quicker than anybody because we we're doing the work ourselves. It's like when you hire a CRO, you have to have your own, 
you up or own employees police them. And sure. so then it just takes so much longer because, you know, there's weekly meetings and then it's like, oh, well, I got to go follow up with the CRO again. And uh, <laughs> right. it, it's like the medical monitors on the, from the CROs, they can't answer the question a lot of the time. So they're like, oh, I don't know. Let me call, you know, the sure. company and I'll figure it out. And um, it just takes so much longer. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, thank you for answering that. Uh, Scott Brown, CFO of Traycon Pharma. It's ticker TCON on the NASDAQ. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you.